How would you react if God took away the person that means the most to you? How our guest handles that situation, a miraculous encounter with God, and more highlight this week's Spirit Answers podcast. Well, Beth, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. No problem. I'm glad to be here. That's my pleasure. So you have uh, an awesome encounter story with God, but uh, it really goes beyond that. It also touches on God's grace through really difficult like trials and and difficult tribulations and circumstances that that you go through. But really, from what I understand, your story starts off with uh, your father and and a difficult circumstance with him. So if you could tell us your story. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the church. Uh, my dad was a pastor and had been my entire life. And, um, so I was just used to, to that kind of lifestyle and, and always took pleasure in being a preacher's kid. Like I've, I've had people ask me like, is that, you know, did, did you hate that? You're probably, you probably couldn't do anything fine. And like, <laughs> I just, I was always a goody two shoe little preacher's kid. I like never wanted to get into any of that stuff. And I liked being able to honor my dad in that way um, and make him proud. So I was pretty good, hung out with some good people and made some good choices growing up. But um, when I was 16, uh, I found out he had a tumor, which wasn't a big deal because I was 16. Like people get tumors, it's fine. And um, didn't really realize how serious it was. And when I, was 18. Uh, I found out that the tumor was like a rare type of cancer and um, that he was likely like going to pass away. And within a year of that, so it was like just after my freshman year of college when I was 19, pretty close to 20, but um, he passed away. And so my dad and I had a really, a really good relationship um pretty much my whole life like i he was my favorite person in existence i just i always wanted to spend my time with him and um and make him proud and so that was just a big adjustment like it would be for most people but i feel like especially for me who grew up like pretty sheltered in a bubble was very protected um by my family by my dad and and so losing him made me feel like kind of vulnerable out in the open and by myself. And um, so the loss of my dad had me go through a big journey of um, not only like who I, who am I, because my identity was like, I am my father's daughter. Um, But, you know, what do I think of God now? Where am I at with faith? Because um, I, I just struggled with prayer in particular because since he had cancer and people knew he was dying and all that stuff. Like we had so many people praying for him and, and myself included. And my dad uh, just had um, really incredible faith and a good relationship with Jesus. And he was praying for God's will. And it's one thing to pray for God's will when you're fine, when you're healthy. It's another thing when you're on death's you know doorstep and, mm-hmm. and you're praying for God to do what he wants, whether that is to keep you on earth or take you home. Yeah. So he, was was praying for God's will. And so was I, because that made sense. I was supposed to do that like he was. But after he died, I was like, but God, God knew, you know, I was praying for God's will, but he knew that I didn't want my dad to die. Like, I just thought his will would line up with what I wanted and um, wasn't the case. So I really struggled with like, who, who is God? He's not good. He doesn't love me. Like, um, I, I think, I mean, it took about a year um, after he died for me, I realized that my faith was more in my dad than in God. And so a lot of what I did, um, as far as making good choices and I'm not gonna say cuss words, and I'm not gonna like go party and I'm gonna read my Bible and pray and go to church and all that kind of stuff. Like that was all because I wanted to make my dad happy. Um, and not because I had any kind of like relationship with God or anything. And at the time I thought I did. Um, so losing my dad was probably like the thing. I mean, that was how God got my attention. Um, even though it was a very negative way. And, and even now I still struggle with like, couldn't you have done it any other way? You know, Mm -hmm. there are other ways you could have gotten my attention than to take away my favorite person. 
Um, and especially at such a young age, like I, I still need my dad. And um, so I went through um, a journey, I think about a month after my dad died, I started to drink. And I remember the first time that I drank, I specifically thought like, you know, my dad's not here to stop me. So I'm just going to do it. You know, like, you know, I have no reason and it wasn't for God. Like, so I just thought I, as immature as it is, like my, my idea behind it, um, eventually as I started to progress into drinking more was like, you disappointed me because you took my dad. So I'm, I know this will disappoint you, this lifestyle that I'm going to choose. Um, and I want to disappoint you <laughs> because I feel like you didn't help me when I needed it. So I um, very quickly realized that I had a problem with it, probably six to nine months in um, of drinking as it like got worse. I realized like there's something wrong, but I, you know, addicts and alcoholics and stuff are pretty good at convincing ourselves that everything's fine or that it could be worse. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would just always say like, well, I'm, it's not like I'm a hobo on the street, like drinking out of a paper bag. Like I, I am going to like a Christian school and mm -hmm. um, I like everything is for the most part, besides my dad being gone, like everything's pretty good in life. Um, and so I just use that as an excuse. Like it's not that big of a deal. And lots of people drink and I'd, I'd go to like parties and stuff. And um, it was, just, I mean, it's a pretty normal lifestyle here. And mm -hmm um being able to drink socially and stuff is not a big deal so i i didn't really make a big deal about it i remember <laughs> the first time i drank and neither of my parents ever drank um and i know that like alcoholism runs like somewhere down the family line but i didn't know a lot about it uh, i didn't grow up around it so i didn't take it as like it's not a big deal i know what i'm doing i'm choosing this you know right um and so my mom uh, knew that I was drinking because I just I didn't care like I was pretty depressed and uh, my way I was I think I was just trying to feel something and you know sometimes I would drink like because I felt like dead inside and sometimes I would drink because my mind just wouldn't stop and I just wanted to not think about my dad for once you know mm -hmm. um, so I used it a lot to cope with different things and um, so the first time I drank my mom was like you're gonna become an alcoholic and I was like oh my gosh way to be dramatic. Like <laughs> this mm -hmm. is the first time I've ever drank, but I understand now. I mean, it was a month after my dad died, like the most traumatic thing of my life, yeah. you know? So. And I just want to um, uh, reemphasize real quick too. And I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, you, fine. so you, you, at this point, you, you still believed in God. It was just that you were mad at him. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was, there was never a point that I denied God's existence um, mm -hmm. because because of how my dad lived and how he died um, right. and, beca and because of other, you know, important people like uh, people in my family and um, friends and stuff like that. Like there, there's something there, you know, I can't, I can't deny it just because I'm mad. I was, I was pretty logical, like throughout um, the whole experience and stuff, being able to make connections and just be like, you know, something about this has to be real, but, but I just want nothing to do with it because I, right. I don't understand um, everything that I grew up hearing about God being loving and being like, you know, in control and all that kind of stuff. Like none of that made sense. So it was just kind of like, obviously you're just a bully, like you're in control to an extreme and you're just going to like make people miserable because you can kind of thing. That was like my process behind it. So yeah, there was never a time I stopped believing in, in him technically. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you just you had never been through anything like this with right. a, a, an understanding that God w ultimately could have done something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I ended up, you know, drinking probably for three, three years total. But from what I've learned, like I'm, I'm currently in AA um, and I've heard that like women alcoholics in particular seem to go like hard and heavy. Like we drink for a few years and um, get it all out, I guess, and, and learn quick from it. And as opposed to like men who drink and, you know, it's usually like a slower process. It takes a lot longer to realize that there's a problem or something like that. Somebody in AA told me that at one point. Um, so 
even though sometimes I'll think like it wasn't that big of a deal. It was only three years. It was like I'll I'll read books about alcoholics and um, people in recovery and that kind of stuff. And a lot of times I'm like, yeah, I did that. I identify with all these things. That, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was pretty bad. I um, I mean, I did a lot of drinking and driving to cope. Uh, I like to drive and blast like heavy rock music and. Um, drinking with side cope. So I just did it together and I thought I was invincible. And sometimes I'd pass cops while I was drinking and driving. And I'm like, see, I can do what I want. Like, <laughs> just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I just got real cocky with it. And um, there were times that it was like, you know, definitely super dangerous. Like um, I, I should have been caught a lot sooner. But anyways, I, I knew I had a problem. Um, probably like, I mean, I, I started to recognize it like six to nine months in, and then I started to realize like I was getting into some pretty unhealthy relationships with men. I think that was like my secondary coping um, to try to deal with the loss. And and so, you know, the first guy I kind of dated ended up being like a little bit abusive, like I would say emotionally, um, kind of just a bully and taking advantage of me and very manipulative and making me feel bad about myself. Um, and, and that like pattern continued. And so like throughout all of that, I, I was still, I was always willing to listen to God. Um, if I really felt like he was telling me something, because again, I still believed in him. I didn't want anything to, to do with him, but if he wanted me to do something to speak to somebody else, like, okay, I'll do that. So I don't want to be getting in the way of somebody else's relationship with God. Um, so if I felt like he wanted me to do something, I'd do it. Um, like I had a, a friend whose dad like was had an, an emergency. He was in the hospital and they thought like he could have died and that kind of thing. And I felt like God was telling me to like pray for him. And I started praying and then he led me to like go to the hospital he was at like an hour away and pray for him. And then wow. Like I was willing to do that because I thought it was helping my friend or helping her dad. Um, and then he ended up being like a mentor and is still like, just, I think he's really great. Um, an important part of my life and stuff. So I, I guess like even through that, through my obedience, God is still like mm -hmm. looking out for me and in that way, yeah. um, even though that wasn't my intention, I was just trying to help someone else. So um, all that to say there, there was a point, um, after I'd realized I had a problem, I, I went through like stints of trying to be sober, you know, I'd, I'd make it three months and then I'd go back and I'd make it six and I'd go back or nine. You know, I, I had like, I think my long, longest was like probably nine months of sobriety up until where I'm at now. Um, and I think during that like period of sobriety, I um, felt like I went, I feel like it's hard for me to say like I I've, I've felt called to anything, but I felt almost nudged, just a little nudge um, to, to go on this ministry thing in Colorado. And I somebody had talked to me about it. Um, it was actually my therapist at the time mentioned somebody that he knew that went on it and was like, you should talk to him about it. And I just feel like God wants me to tell you about this opportunity and maybe you can look into it and that kind of thing. So I kind of, you know, took my time and, and try to figure things out. And, um, eventually I <laughs> interviewed with the people and they like, you know, accepted me into it about a month or a couple months maybe before I was supposed to be there. So it was like, I have to raise $6,000 by myself, wow. uh, in, in a couple months. And I was a poor college kid. I could barely afford mm -hmm. my rent. So it's like, where's this going to come from? And, um, I ended up like, I don't know, just talking to people, sending out letters, like they had a lot of good ideas for trying to raise funds. Um, I, t I spoke in front of a handful of churches um, and told them basically, this is where I'm at with God. I, I feel like I need, I need something from him. Like I'm at, I was at a point in my life by then that like, he still wasn't my favorite, but it was like, I, I feel like there, I need some kind of spark. I need to like, I need to encounter him is, is what I went with when I would tell people, like, I, I'm told like, basically the whole point of this is to go out and they give you two months of opportunities 
to have some kind of encounter with God, to see God and what you're doing. Um, so that's what I went with. And um, I was able to raise the money. And, you know, I started raising funds and it was like the first week I got like a hundred dollars and the second week I got, I had like a few hundred more and it was like, Oh no, this is not <laughs> like, wow. six thousand dollars. Wow. And so I, I get to like, I, you know, I think we were like a couple weeks away and I called the people and said like, can I do an extension? And they were like, well, like, you know, you, we can probably extend it a couple more weeks or whatever, but wouldn't you know it? I got six thousand dollars within that last two weeks. Wow! And didn't even need the extension, so that's it was like, incredible. And <laughs> again, crazy. I think it's worth it's worth highlighting that you uh, uh, listen to God uh, again. That's twice since that uh, really difficult experience, you know, going through your father's death that you that you still listen to God even though you were uh, very upset with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I I went on that trip and um. You know, when I remember thinking like once once I fly on the plane, I think that's when it'll set in and feel like, you know, God God wants me here, right? And then I <laughs> there for a few weeks, there for a month, and I'm like, I still don't know why I'm here. I don't like this is great. Everybody has great things going on. And like I've heard I've I've had some little things with God here and there and I've been able to open up a little bit. Um, but just I don't know. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just doing what I feel like God's told me to do. And I guess if nothing happens with it, whatever. The only downside is that I have to go back to all these churches to thank them for their funds and that I won't have anything cool to talk about. So, <laughs> um, I just question, you know, I just questioned a lot. I always question him. I'm still like that. I'm pretty skeptical. Um, but on that trip, just, just a little over, like, I think being halfway done, um, there was a pastor there, um, named Rob, Rob that I was really close to and like he's spoken to me a lot um and I talked to him previously about forgiveness it is my biggest like default my inability to forgive I hold on to things and I very much want control which I think comes from losing my dad and being in such a big situation in my life and not being able to have any control over what is happening so um I still struggle with that but back back then I was talking to him about my inability to forgive and some situations that happened to me previously. And, um, we worked through like forgiveness that day and that was great. And then, um, when we, we were about to go to like the next leg of the trip, like another transition as we had done throughout the summer. And I had just told him like, I feel like I, I want to take another step. Um, whatever that looks like probably, I mean, maybe like forgiveness again. I mean, I've, so many grudges, uh, so many people that I could forgive. So let's just pick another one and go, go for it again. And so we sat down and, um, he led me through praying. Cause I told him, I literally like, I don't ever think I've really fully forgiven anyone. And so I'm like, I don't even know how to pray about this. I'll, I feel like my first step is just to, I need God to like, just open my heart to that because I don't, I don't even want to do it. I'm just doing it like, because I feel like I should, um, and so, you know, we're, we're praying through that. And, um, I was, I was talking to God, we kind of, we were in our own prayer and then we would like reconvene. And so I was praying and asking God, like, all right, I've got this person and this person and this person and this person. And I'm like listing, like, here, here are all the options for people that you can choose for me to, for to forgive and go through that process. Like, I don't know where to start. So just pick one of the people and, and we'll go from there. And God told me like, Beth, I want you to forgive yourself. And I said, that's stupid. Like, <laughs> and I, I told the, the pastor, I was like, I, I think this is what God said, but that doesn't make sense. So, and, and he like was affirming that like, yeah, that sounds like God, <laughs> you know? And, and how are you going to be able to forgive people? Um, if you don't know how to figure yourself, like if you haven't experienced that. So, so we prayed through that and, um, I, I actually, so like the first relationship I, I had talked about where, um, he was like kind of abusive and stuff is a relationship that I had with, with a guy that I had found out, um, was in a relationship with another woman and he didn't tell me that initially. Um, and so like, I don't, I didn't completely blame myself for that situation, but then I continued to see him 
and kind of date him like mostly because he was like my drinking buddy and I didn't have a lot of other people and and I had a habit I needed to take care of so um I think that was kind of the draw to him even though he treated me badly and um since that time so it had been like at least um two years or so I I had considered myself to be a whore because that's that's why like I'm like in the movies every time you see a movie and some girl is sleeping with somebody's spouse or you know whatever like like everybody assumes she's a whore that kind of thing so it's like that's that's how I am that's who I am like that became <laughs> mm -hmm. part of my identity mm -hmm. um and so I had asked God when I was praying with Rob um like I need a step. I just, I don't even know what to do with that one. And I can't, I'm just not, again, not good at letting go. So I can't just fully be like, I completely forgive the whole situation. Like, and mm -hmm. so I asked what, um, what we could do, how we could go about that. And, um, he said like, the first thing I want you to forgive yourself for is, is for considering yourself to be a whore because that's not who I've created you to be. And that's not who you are. And, um, so it's very, very emotional time mm -hmm. after, after thinking for years that that's who I was. Wow. Um, and so we were praying through that and Rob was telling me like, you should, we need, we need to like ask God to replace that. Um, so, so basically like, you know, if I just let it go and say, okay, I'm not a horror anymore, <laughs> then, there, there needs to be something like put in that place that if that thought starts to come up, then I can say like, no, this is who God has said I am. Um, and so we prayed about that and he said beautiful, which I was like, oh, that's so cliche. Everybody like you said this to everyone and everybody says that like God thinks you're beautiful, you know? So it's like, thanks God, but okay. Um, and I know there was, there was a second word, but I, I can't remember it. Honestly, I probably have it written down somewhere, but um, the one that, got me was that um he told he told me that I was holy and I it didn't make any sense um and I you know was discussing that and just said like that like God is holy what do you mean I'm holy I'm just I'm <laughs> very much a sinner making a lot of bad decisions and going through this whole process and like I don't understand how you would even say that um and and rob just mentioned like you know it's again affirming like that does sound like something god would say you didn't just make it up in your mind that's usually my argument it's like i probably just thought that on my own um but he said like you are holy because you like have jesus and you you believe in jesus and because he is holy like that's how god can see you um so anyways very emotional, very, very much like a relief and a good process for me. And then to add to, to that, I mean, that's a good story and situation in, in and of itself. But um, after that, Rob told me that he, you know, he's like, I don't understand how this works. Um, and I know you're going to have questions, but I, I, I don't know, but I'm just being obedient to God and God wants me to tell you that your dad was able to see this moment and is rejoicing with you and your forgiveness. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just, I don't see myself as like a super emotional person, but man, did I cry? I just like, I, I can imagine. Yeah. It's I incredible being like, just, I don't know, not like super into like, the spiritual side of things and heaven. I just, I just always imagined even growing up, I always thought like if people die and go to heaven, they have no idea what's going on on earth. Why would they, why would they pay attention? Like heaven's supposed to be really great. Like who cares what's going on on earth, you know? Um, and I, I mean, I believe my dad went to heaven, but I just, the fact that it was like confirmed for, for God to be like, yeah, your dad's here and he saw you and all that kind of stuff. And, and I mean, I don't know how it works. Like, I don't know if they always can see it or if God gave a special moment, but, but the fact that God used that 
and he could have shown me any way that he wanted to, that he loved me, but it's like the most, he, he just knows me intimately. And that's my dad is my favorite person. And, mm -hmm. um, he connected me with the most important person when he mm. didn't have to. And that it was just like the ultimate way to show me love in that moment. And, mm. um, so even though I still struggled with that, it's God just gave me like a moment with my dad almost. Mm. That is just so cool and, and, and so powerful. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm thankful that you were able to have that because that um, that means that you didn't have to go back to all those churches and say that you didn't have an encounter for one, <laughs> but also just that's yeah. just, uh, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine just after all the, after all that you had been through that, that was just so absolutely beyond incredible. Um, and just, I'm sure that it also did. Um, I'm sure that from, from a relational standpoint with God, that it, it, shifted things just a little bit even if it didn't seem like things went back to the way that they were before your your dad died mm -hmm. i'm sure that it, it 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 at least provided somewhat of a shift in your in your understanding of the, how that relationship is and uh your maybe your understanding of god yeah and i mean like like i said before at the beginning you know when after my dad died um i had realized that my faith was more in my dad than in god right. Um, and so it's, it was kind of, it was a process then that I realized like I was more religious, um, and legalistic and all of that instead of having a relationship. And I remember my dad preaching about like having a relationship with God, but I guess, I don't know what I, I thought about it. And I know that I thought I had a relationship, but now that I actually have one, <laughs> I know that I really didn't. I just was going through the motions kind of thing and, um, doing what looked right as far as being a Christian and all that. So I think like, um, I guess that, that moment was another like transition into like this, you know, this is strengthening this, this new relationship because I really didn't have one before. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like it, my faith definitely didn't and still doesn't look like it did back before my dad died. But now that I realize um, that I didn't really have a relationship with God, like good, I don't want it to look like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, mm -hmm. I want it to be genuine and authentic. And um, that's why I'm like so open about where I've been and where I'm at and that it's not perfect and all that because it's, it's more real now than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really well said. So, so we understand after that you didn't, it, it wasn't the experience that packed, you started packing your bags and going to seminary. This is kind of <laughs> where it, the, the grace part comes in a little bit. So yeah. can you kind of tell us, what happens as it relates to that? Yeah. So um, when I got back home, like that trip was a couple months in the summer. Um, I got back home like in July, I think. And um, things were things were fine. Like still kind of like on that high of, of those experiences and um, being able to go to the churches and share that story in particular and tell them like, you know, your, your money was not wasted and you've, you had like a kingdom impact and all of that. Um, and a couple months after I got back, like I started feeling um, kind of like nudged by God to, to get baptized, which I had grown up thinking like, I don't know. I feel like my dad kind of, he, he would always say that we shouldn't, get baptized like all the time. He's like, you don't need to do that like once a year or whatever. Like it's, you know, you've made your commitment, you've made your, your decision to follow Jesus. And so like, you know, you, if you get baptized, like just that's good enough. You don't need to do it all the time. Um, and so like, I just live my life like, all right, I got baptized when I was 12. I'm good to go. Don't need to do that anymore. And mm -hmm. so for God to be like, yeah, I want you to get baptized. I was like, I already did. Like, <laughs> why would mm -hmm. you want me to do it again? Um, and it was it just a very similar nudging to what to what you had had before when God had told you to do things. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the usual route that God like, and and I tend to be introverted and like I don't I get overwhelmed if it's like this big experience. So like God doesn't, I don't think He really talks to me in like a huge like here's a giant sign to show you like. Like he has to nudge me and like mm -hmm. give me whispers and tell me day by day and that kind of thing. Because otherwise I'm like, 
too much. Nope, we're not mm -hmm. doing that. <laughs> sure, sure. So, yeah, I think um, like he usually does, he just kind of started to like place that into my mind and heart. And um, I still questioned it and thought like I – I don't, I don't feel it. I've always, I've struggled um, with, with an emotional connection with God. And I still feel like even now, like I still feel like I don't have a super emotional connection. I'm not like, that's not how I worship. And I just kind of like stand there and sing, but I feel it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know. That's not how I express myself. And that's, that's not how I feel like um, I can, I'm connected with God, but I want it. I want to feel like I have a passion um, but my, my faith has mostly been logical. Like I'm just making decisions because I know like if God's telling me to do something, I'm going to do it. And this is like, um, what I feel like will honor God. So I'm going to make these decisions, even though, like, even if my emotions don't match up. So I was struggling with the idea of getting baptized because I, I felt like it should be emotional, like a little bit. And so like, shouldn't I feel like I, I'm in a good place because even though I just went on this trip, like I still have a lot that I'm working on and, and all that. And, um, I talked to some pastors at my church, like multiple, I talked to multiple people. Cause I was like, if this, like, this doesn't make sense. I need you to make it make sense. Um, or tell me that I'm not hearing God. So I don't do this, you know? And, and most of them, I mean, agreed. Like if God's telling you, here's, here's some evidence and this is kind of how he is sometimes like, and just, gave me different ideas of how God interacts and it's not always going to make sense to me. Um, but if I'm obedient, then it will, it will provide fruit in the future. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended up getting baptized um, the following October of that year. So a few months later um, and it was like, I remember, I think there's, there's a picture that my mom took of me like after I had, gotten out of the water and I was going up the steps and she was like, you were just beaming. Like she has like a picture of just, I don't know. My, my face showed it all of like what an experience that was, what a weight, what a weight lifted. And um, so I got baptized and that was great. And then I don't, I don't remember what in particular happened. Um, I I think Oh, I, I think that the, the month after I got back, I was like, my mom had hurt herself and uh, like broken some bones and I had to move back in with her um, to help take care of her because she didn't really have anyone else. And she lived across the street from where my dad died. So I just like, it was too much. And regardless of where I was at with God, I <laughs> um, ended up drinking again eventually. So um, I started... I started drinking and um, like hanging out with that crowd again. And I'd met a guy um, that, I mean, I didn't know him super well, but we, we would go like drink together sometimes, go to bars and stuff. And there was one particular time, like it was in March the following year. So I've been drinking again for a few months. And, and typically my, my pattern was that I, if I lost my sobriety, then I lost it. Like, it's like, I, um, it wasn't just like a, oh, I drank one night. Okay. Next day, I really need to get it together. Like hop, hop back on and I try to be sober again. It was like, nope, I I'm not sober anymore. So I'm just going to go be not sober, like continue mm -hmm. right. <laughs> drinking it, and partying. It's done. It's I, done. Forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, I'll just wait till the next crappy thing happens to me and then maybe I'll stop. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, there, there was just one of those times, um, in March, of 2017 uh i had gone drinking with that guy and he asked me to pick him up and take him to the bar um which i didn't really want to but i mean i drank and drive all the time so whatever it's not a big deal and uh we drank and i was pretty intoxicated um and he didn't live super far from there so <laughs> i um thought it was fine and i, I think like there were officers waiting for people like me to leave the bar. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so I left and somebody immediately pulled up behind me. Um, and then I didn't stop completely at a stop sign. And so they had a reason to pull me over and then did like the breathalyzer and I blew a point one three. Um, so I got arrested and did the whole nine yards with, with that, all the little tests they do at the jail and 
Um, and they put me in the drunk tank is what they call it. So it's just you sober up basically. Um, and so I stayed, I stayed there and sobered up and then they put me like in, in a holding cell. So I, I didn't technically have to go up into the jail. They didn't put me in the jumpsuit or anything. Um, cause I ended up getting bailed out, but I did call my mom at two in the morning and mm. said, guess where I am <laughs> mm. I was just intoxicated and didn't know how to say it. Like, yeah, Nicely, I guess. I don't know. But made her cry and she's, hmm. you know, trying to figure out what to do. Cause I mean, she she told me if you ever get arrested, I'm I'm not letting you out. Like, good luck. <laughs> you know. Hmm. And which isn't her typical uh personality. So I respect that. Like mm -hmm. you. good for you, Mom. Mm -hmm. Um but the guy I was drinking with, I don't know if he felt bad, like because he pushed me to drive or like what, but he ended up letting me out. So um yeah, I I was in a pretty rough spot uh, with that, and just um, I had was still going to school. It took me a very long time to get my bachelor's degree, and so I'm still going to school at this point, um, like full blown alcoholism and um, pretty depressed. Like I don't know, just I I had a lot going on. I'm trying to help my mom get better, and I realized at that point that it was like I can't stay here. Like this <laughs> obviously is not good for me to be right where my dad died, basically. Um, so I moved out and found a place with some roommates and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I just, I think the thing that that I expected was like, I got arrested, um, I'm losing everything. You know, I, I'm in this program, like I'm, I'm trying to be a social worker and um, I'm working like two jobs through the school because I need to pay bills and stuff. And, um, you know, I have like friends and family that love me and stuff, but I expected to lose all of it. Just I'm getting kicked out of school because I'm at a conservative Christian school that I signed a contract where I said I wouldn't drink at all, let alone get arrested. Um, I'm going to lose those jobs because I can't work there if I don't go to the school and my friends are going to be upset with me. And like, they, some of them are concerned already that like, like, man, she's drinking a lot. Like, we, you know, or like kind of just being a little like isolated. We don't really know what's going on. And, and like, I think my family started to have an idea, especially my mom, um, that there was something going on there. And so I just, I just thought I was going to lose everything. And, you know, when I, I was sitting in jail, like just crying a bunch. Cause I was like, I don't even know what I'm going to do anymore. Like I, I will have nothing after I get out of here. Um, and so the first thing was that I, um, talked to my school about the situation and they decided not to kick me out, um, wow. which was kind of a big deal because <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure people do get kicked out, um, for, for things like that. And so they, they chose to let me, I don't know, basically we would just went through like a plan of like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drink. I'm not definitely not going to get arrested. And focus on school and try to do like, so I had to follow through with that. And then I, I, you know, the two jobs that I had through the school, I talked to both of my bosses and, um, I mean, either one of them should have fired, both of them should have fired me. And like, you know, the, even their supervisors, um, I remember one of them like saw in the paper and texted me. It was like, is this you? And I was like, yep. Wow. <laughs> So he, um, he actually, he's real sweet. He actually, um, like met me for coffee or something to like check on me and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, just some really good people at that yeah. place and, and neither of them fired me. I even, I lost my license for a few months. Um, and one of the jobs required me to drive and they still didn't fire me. They dropped me off to do my job and then came <laughs> and picked me up. <laughs> so it's like, I do not deserve this. Um, but I, I ended up, you know, getting my license back within a few, Few, within a couple months, but even that process was a lot faster. Um, according to the lawyer, he was like, "Oh, I'll get it back to you sooner than usual." Because I mean, they, from their perspective, they're like, "It's you've never done anything. It's your first DUI. People do this sometimes, that kind of thing." But for me, I'm like, "Oh, I know, I have a problem." Like, <laughs> uh -huh. and so I don't deserve but, all this. But so that's the, that's three different instances already yeah. where something um, more extreme would have been the norm, and. Right. Uh, that was not the case for you. Yeah. And, and like on, on top of that, just the fact that none of my friends or family like abandoned me or mm -hmm. even like treated me super different. Um, 
from from my perspective at least. So just every avenue that I should have been punished and I would have expected to be punished and I'm I'm pretty hard on myself so I it wasn't like I expected it was I even thought like I deserve this. I deserve to lose everything and um have to start things over and you know I've already struggled to get through school like whatever this is it's my fault for making a stupid decision um and and the fact that there wasn't even really like one punishment besides my own mind <laughs> like mm -hmm. making it hard on myself um I I mean I had to do like some community service hours and um obviously some logistical stuff with with like insurance and all of that higher rates but like I mean nothing i i lost nothing so i just i really felt like in that experience like that god didn't just give me grace you know he could have given me grace in in just one area like okay here you can still go to school but like you'll lose your jobs and your family's going to be upset and that kind of thing um he gave me abundant grace like grace in all areas that he could could have given me and that was just um it was another really big step, I think, of of feeling closer to God, um, and and that he and that he cared, and that he mm -hmm. was in you know in control of all that. Um, so I I don't know. I just I knew I didn't deserve it. I mean, that's what grace is. I didn't deserve any of it at all, and I got like completely covered. And and so that was just a huge experience you know i i'd experienced grace before but never like that and so it, it just had like a big impact um on on how i was moving forward mm. wow that is just yeah. so so incredible and i yeah. love it i love it because it shows that life isn't always like you know how how it's portrayed in the movies especially maybe like uh you know christian movies or media where everything wraps up in a perfect bow um right. you know life is is tough it's challenging um, it doesn't always go in that uh, picture perfect way that we want it to go. But even through all that, um, God provides us. And I think he acknowledges us when we, when we do follow those nudges. I think that that's our, our part of the relationship. And I think that just like when Jesus talks about in the new Testament, when he says that, um, when he's talking about how he needs to, to be a part of the relationship with like the disciples and he needs to like wash their feet first. I think that, I think that God he want he wants a relationship no matter no, he he understands that we're not we're never going to be perfect and like you i can't remember if you said it before we started recording or after but when god looks at us he sees that um that sacrifice that jesus made he sees he's mm -hmm. he sees his son in us um he sees that holiness i think that's where that's where it comes back to is that holiness that, that you heard when when god said that you were holy and um i think it can be very easy to lose sight of that and and be hard on ourselves and uh when 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 we're stumbling, but, um, I just love that your, your testimony shows us that, uh, through all those really difficult times that God is still looking out for us. And there's still that relationship there. You, even if it doesn't happen on our own timing, um, God is still able to work things out in, in, in beautiful ways. And in ways that as someone that like myself, I have a creative writing degree. I, I couldn't even write how, how these things go a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, so I just think it's a, it's a really powerful, really powerful testimony. Yeah. And I, I also want to say like, um, what has continued to be, and, and it, it will in the future as I'm able to be sober, um, a big part of my testimony is that I'm currently about four and a half years sober. So I'm wow. on a great path. That's I've incredible. finally like yeah. I made it past that really like tough zone, you know, in the beginning mm -hmm. when you go back and forth. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's incredible. Like the, the difference that like, yeah, serious like 180 difference of yeah. of a relationship with god and what it can do for your life so yeah 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 wow uh well beth i i can't thank you enough for taking the time to share uh your story with us and the and the the difficulties that you've traversed but you've successfully done it successfully done it with with god's help and in, in, in that relationship and and um even though like you said it's not how it was before you're dad passed away it you, you, god has been able to use that and shape the relationship maybe in a way that from a long-term spiritual perspective is is more beneficial and i'm sure that as as you continue to to go and and, and live life and continue on your relationship with god that you'll continue to kind of because i think a lot of times it's the case you can kind of look back and kind of connect the dots and see 
why certain things happen happen the way that they do. And even if you don't have all the answers on this side, um, I think that you'll find that uh, the the more that you live, the more that this relationship carries on. I think that you'll see that overarching plan there. And uh, and I think that the difficulties that you traverse, I think that those can make that relationship even stronger, even if it's really, really challenging to, to go through. And uh, so I just think that a lot of people are going to be able to relate to your story because the life is really, really challenging. And, and many people are going through very difficult circumstances themselves. And I'm sure that they're going to be able to relate to you and your, and your resilience that you've had in God. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that everybody. Um, if you could share this with one person, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, I really, really appreciate that. And um, that goes a long way to getting our name out there to people that might not otherwise know about the podcast yet. Um, also a reminder to send your testimony in to spirit answers podcast at gmail.com. That testimony may be a miraculous healing, an encounter with an angel or demon, a uh, just a general miracle, uh, new age to Christianity testimony, uh, really anything that either led you to God or strengthened your relationship with God. Uh, feel free to send me the video of that. Many people on this show have a video on YouTube. Send me the link to that, or you can send me a short uh, written testimony as well. Um, also, just a reminder that we have a Facebook group, the only place that you can find us uh, uh, outside of the podcast apps and on YouTube, uh, just called Spirit Answers on Facebook, where you can interact with people such as Beth um, and many of the guests that we have on this show, as well as get a sneak peek of next week's episode and discuss all things supernatural and how it relates to truth. Uh, lastly, I want to give you an opportunity, if you have not done so already, to ask God to reveal himself to you. And uh, you know, just ask God what, whatever is easiest for you, maybe speak it out loud in prayer, Ask him to reveal himself to you in a personal way. And uh, if you do this over, over a period of time, I guarantee you that you will find the truth that you're looking for. And a uh, relationship with God, um, uh, the peace that comes with that, is unlike anything you'll ever in encounter in this life. Um, there really is nothing, as I've said several times before, like having a relationship with the creator of everything. Uh, and uh, just just as you know, spiritual beings, we, we require some some kind of... Uh, relationship with the spiritual and and if we don't do that then um, many of you I'm sure at some point in your life or maybe this is you right now are filling that void with things that are not fulfilling maybe they're offering temporary temporary relief such as you know video games or, or drinking um, or uh, you know any any anything that you're doing really to fear to fill that spiritual void maybe it's work maybe you're overworking um, uh, I guarantee that if you find that if you search for and, and you have that relationship with God, that will um, alleviate everything that you've been doing up to this point to try to, to fill that hole that only God, our creator, and a relationship with him can fill. So again, I would just ask you to not give up and uh, please do this over a period of time. And uh, you know, I, I, I can't wait to, to hear the, the results of, of you doing that. Um, I just want to thank you again for everything that you do to support the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I hope that you have a fantastic week. I will be praying for you like always. Take care. See you next week.